Welcome to Musicians of Beyond with Lawhorn and Sarabian as we continue our conversation under the covers with the renowned album cover designer, Ernie Sheffaloo. Buckle up. I've done 250 covers. Not every one was iconic. Not every one of them was, you know, great. But there's a lot of bands that are left out here, you know, like really cool bands like Jefferson Airplane and The Doors. It was really a great experience. And we talked about that before, being a fan. And then just a few years later, working with them, helping them create the branding that still goes on to this day. I mean, BG still used their logo. Alice Cooper uses his, you know, I mean, there's all these great Jesus Christ superstar, the Rolling Stones. They, even though they've got Pache's version in mine and a dozen other ones, you still see mine pop up. They just did a shirt, I think last year where it was my logo, it was like 450 bucks, you know? So, and, and I've got pictures of all of them wearing it. And, and the controversy really is cool too, because you get a lot of people that get involved from a, from a political standpoint and, and, and knowing, you know, knowing this or knowing that, and most of them weren't even born when it was happening, you know, I mean, which is really kind of ironic. And so one of the other things along with concept on these packages was the lettering. I, I we had talked about this before. I was never really a big fan of lettering. Um, I always kind of, I guess it was because I wasn't really that good at it. It was, it, it, but it became a necessity. You know, it's, it's like, you never realize, you know, how how important it is to be able to embrace something like that until it's your only option you know and i needed lettering i couldn't get it in set type i couldn't get it in photo type so i had to create it started with smith smith perkins or not smith perkins smith but uh matthew southern comfort ian matthews and 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 uh, uh, an album that i had done for him and i couldn't get any kind of so i just did it and, and it was kind of funny because when the, when the album cover stuff started happening for me, the lettering stuff started happening too. And the concept stuff, you know, it was always strong in concept. So now the concept is wild. It's like, unlike working, you know, when I was working for New York, you know, New York life insurance and wearing blenders and mixers and, and these very corporate accounts, um, you know, Ralston and Purina, they, you didn't have that kind of freedom. You couldn't get crazy with it, you know, and the record business was the crazier you get, the better it is. So I really was starting to lean toward that. And at that same time, the lettering thing came in because you couldn't, you couldn't get custom lettering. It was like, you know, type that was either set like a, for a newspaper with lead melting and setting up here or phototype, which was, you know, negatives on a big reel and they expose it to a photographic paper and you get, but it was a fortune. You know, now every computer has a, a type house in it. You know, I've got my, on my computer, there's got to be 100,000 type fonts, you know, that I can just get and set, and, you know, I mean, and it's awesome, you know, so, but it also put out, it put the business of typesetting out of business, you know, so, but the same thing is happening with the, you know, printing and stuff. You don't have to make film anymore. You just get a digital file and you put it in the printing press and that's it. So they're skipping plates, they're skipping all these different, pieces that you used to have. And that's kind of interesting because the lettering that you see behind me, I've done 300, uh, 530 different logos in branding. 530, there's just a few of them. And, you know, these are still being used. Quincy still uses his, Alice uses his. Black Sabbath, they didn't use it, you know, which was kind of one of the other things that we talked about where, you know, these were things that, you know, that Black Sabbath lettering was something that was never used. You know, but it, it, today it would be a, a great heavy metal logo. Back then, they wanted to use that big SS heavy clunky looking thing that was just terrible. And, you know, I mean, we had no say about it. When I saw the finished album in the record store, it was like, what happened here? You know, we had a white background around the illustration. We had that lettering at the top and Sabbath Bloody Sabbath at the bottom. And they took it, put black all around it with that big clunky lettering at the top and their name real small at the bottom. So, you know, I mean, and, and we didn't really have any say in it, you know, and that kind of happened a lot. It happened a lot with, um, you know, one of the other, there are two other instances where that's happened, where, you know, things that we created, it's come top of mind. One of them was for a, 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 
creative director named Ed Thrasher that was at Warner Brothers, right? He was a creative director, Warner Brothers Records. And he really loved our work. And he really would, because we were doing a lot of work through Warner Brothers for Alice and other bands. And, you know, he's trying to push his art department. He's a creative director, but we're getting the work. And because the, the groups had control. So that was kind of an interesting thing. And so he kind of put up with us and pretended like he liked us. And he really was a huge fan of Drew's work. So what he did was he created a project for us. We, he wasn't giving us work. You know, we were a competitor. So he created this project and it was the soundtrack from Robin Hood, the Errol Flynn movie done in the forties, I guess it was. And they were gonna release the soundtrack and he wanted us to do an illustration of Errol Flynn for the, the cover of this vinyl record, right? So I gotta tell you, Drew did this most amazing painting of Errol Flynn with his hands on his hips like Robin Hood, you know, with the hat, the feather, it was unbelievable. Turned it into Ed Thrasher, did mechanical on it and everything, turned it into Ed Thrasher. Warner Brothers pays us, but we don't get the art back. It's like, hey, Ed, where's the art? Finally, he took our call and said, oh, well, you know, they, they canceled the project. You know, they, they, they canceled the release. And so that never happened. And I said, okay, all right, that's cool. But where's the artwork? He said, well, we own it. And I said, what do you mean we, you own it? You don't own it. You know, you, well, we paid you, right? Yeah, well, we own it. And so, you know, it's like, okay, you know, what can I do? I have no recourse. You know, it, it's just like that, you know. And it also happened... Um, with George Carlin. Uh, and there's a third one that we'll talk about on this next frame that's behind me. It was a, an album that we did for George Clark Carlin. And it was uh, for class, not, it was Occupation Fool was the name of the album. Okay, we got the assignment to do it. Drew, Warner Brothers, uh, was it Warner Brothers? No, it was Little David Records actually, but they were distributed by, I forget what other company it was, but they, um, we did this beautiful illustration, Drew did, of George Carlin with one of these court jester hats on. And it was, he was on, but it was that, it was George on like that. And it was on one of the sticks, like the gestures would have, because it was a head on a stick. And so he did this beautiful illustration there. The record company took it, rejected that. And we ended up doing a bunch of photography for that album cover never returned the artwork. You know, it, it happened a, a couple of times. And, and then we, we started putting stickers on the back of every piece that we did, including the mechanicals and stuff. You know, this is exclusive property of Pacific Ioneer. You know, our attorney advised us to do that because we had no reports. They pay us, you know, we, you know, they got the work, even though it was never released or never used, they got it, you know, and it just really, I mean, it was because both those pieces, I'll never forget them because it was when we had started working with Drew. And I mean, the guy was just amazing. He, and he's the one that did this Black Sabbath piece behind me. You know, he did the Welcome to My Nightmare. He did a lot of really great illustrations for Pacific Eye in here, 70, 73 of his original pieces. So, you know, I mean, it, we, we lost a couple and I gave a few away, but, you know, I ended up being able to keep quite a bit of them. So, you know, it, it, was, uh, it was really kind of an interesting, time and we were trying to not offend people so you try and you know take one for the gipper and just try and be more careful next time so you know that's kind of how all that worked and you know it's funny Ernie, you, you mentioned that i was listening to a podcast the other day and i i wish i could remember which one but i believe it was miranda lambert was the artist on on the guest and she was telling a story of how she finally got her song in front of the ad or the the, the executive she wanted in front of and someone had told her on the envelope, right, requested material from Miranda Lambert. And that way the guy would think, oh, it the envelope stands out because, oh, we must have asked for this. Yeah. So whoever it was that listened said, oh, yeah, let's get her in, signs her to her label. And I think on the 20th anniversary of the release of the album, he broke it out and he kept that that envelope all those years and right, gave yeah. it to as a gift 20 years yeah. later. Isn't That's that funny? I mean, stuff like we, we, you know, we I once did an ad 
one of our ads we ran in Billboard magazine and uh, it was a Pacific Ironer ad and some guy took it out, of, cut it out of the magazine and put it on his refrigerator. And two years later, he called us <laughs> because he had kept that. And when he got to the point where he wanted product you know, worked on and dust up done, he called us. So you never know. I mean, putting it out there, you know, I mean, all it takes is one person that's interested enough to reach back out or know that person, you know, that, that would be. And, you know, that's kind of how I am with, with this art. You know, John and I were talking earlier about, you know, I've got all this artwork and, you know, you know, uh, shows like you guys do and Goldmine Magazine wanting to take interest in diversifying what they're doing. They What happened was they started selling vinyl. And it really was a big boost for them, you know, because uh, there are avid vinyl collectors out there. And it'll never be what it was, but it's always going to be a niche market that will help them beyond just doing magazines. And I was sure. telling John, you know, the, the people that the one guy owns all of these like 13 magazines, Revolver and Heavy Metal and, and you know, um, Goldmine and a bunch of other magazines. And, and you know. I'm very excited about what's going on with that because it all comes back with a documentary that what you guys are doing, what Joyce is doing with Ernie's Corner. It's, it's kind of getting out there and eventually, you know, I'm, I'm a firm believer in if you, you know, if you just keep it up, eventually you'll get a shot. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's how it was with Pacific Ironier. We, you know, we didn't really know anybody when we came to Los Angeles, we had a promise from the guy we were working for that was no good and never materialized and you know but had we not done that had had the work been there pacific eye and ear would have never happened it's interesting how when you look back you know at what what you've done and what life has put in front of you you know and it's just really it's for me it's you know i'm going to be 78 next month and it's it's unbelievable on one hand, you know, I mean, it's believable because I have all these images that I can look at and go, oh, I remember that 1971, you know, I mean, who the hell remembers it from 1971? I and mean, if I didn't have those stakes in the ground, what would be harder to remember? But all I have to do is look at any image. You can come to my space. There's thousand images. In fact, the guy from Bottoms, the, the auction house came out and I was telling him, you know, he goes, geez, you know, you know, you, you have all, I said, pick any piece out you want. Just, there's a whole bunch over there, pick whatever you want. I'll, you know, it's like a magician, you know, keep, I'll look the other way, pick something out and I'll tell you the whole story about it. And, and, and he couldn't believe it, you know I mean? But it was easy because I lived it and I've got something to look at more than just a memory of what it used to look like. You know, well, so we're, that really we're, we're hoping somewhere along in, in the uh, universe out there, there is a listener who saw something in their dad's office or up in the attic. And it's one of those pieces you were just talking about where you never got that artwork back. Well, maybe yeah. that executive's listening and says, Oh, you know what? Yeah. I should return that to Ernie. No, no. What that executive was thinking, Hey man, this is as true as that. I can sell it <laughs> a lot of money. You know, that's what they're thinking, you know, but that's okay. You know, I mean, I, for the longest time, when I realized that I had something of value for the longest time, I regretted, the pieces I gave away, the pieces that I lost in a flood in my parents' basement, you know, and, and then I, I stopped, you know, dwelling on that and started rejoicing in what I had kept, you know, and what I don't have as an original, I have an image of, or I have a printed piece of, because I've done, I don't know, five, 6,000 projects. I mean, it's crazy. I've got a job book from the first 14 years. It shows every job. There's something like, I don't know, 2,000 jobs or 3,000, whatever it is. And I know who I did it, who, who we did it for, what it was, what it cost, what month, what year we did it, you know, who, who illustrated, who designed it. I have all that. My partner was, uh, he was really uh, an adamant about keeping a diary. And that's what he did on Pacific Guy here. Because we were, you know, on an average month, we would do six album covers and maybe seven or eight corporate projects in the same month. So, and we were five, six people. I mean, we didn't really, and I think that was part of the, the and I know it was because I've had this conversation with Drew and Bill Garland, and I've heard them talk about it where, you know, rather than just being an illustrator, they came to Pacific Ironier and learned how to do production 
learned how to do, you know, more about design and composition and how to work with somebody that puts lettering on what they're executing. I mean, there was Pacific Pioneer was a growing uh, place. It's where we were really stretching our wings and we were all coming up at the same time. I was 26, you know, Drew was at, at 25, 24, you know, Bill was 24 or five. Joe Garland was the old, or uh, Joe Garnett was the older guy. He was in his thirties, but you know, he had, uh, him and Klaus Warman were studio mates because Klaus was an illustrator before he, and a musician, a musician. And he did the Revolver album for the Beatles, that line drawing, that was Klaus Warman. And he was Joe Garnett's studio mate. And Joe, and he split up and Joe came to work for Pacific Pioneer. We did the Doors album, a bunch of stuff with him. He passed away a few years ago, along with Carl Ramsey, who was our airbrush guy. But we had a great team, you know. You know, and I, I, I'm really, you know, I'm really the most luckiest person in the whole world, you know, to be part of that team, you know, and being able to create it and be be the director of it, you know. Kind of, it was like Pacific Idea was like a band, you know. We were start out playing local gigs and high school stuff and working out of our garage, and then all of a sudden you get a hit single. <clears throat> And now you've got some traction and now we start getting recognition and we become part of what's going on, you know? And then we look around and people are emulating us, copying the way we would approach something, you know, disruptive. Pacific Ironeer was always disruptive. We were never conservative. We were never, you know, there's, a, there's two things. When you come to what we do, what I do, you can either go with what you know the person will buy which is what I learned in the advertising business. You sell them what you know they'll buy. And in the other part of it is you sell them what they need, you know, and that's really kind of what, that's how I started out my career. That's how I ran Pacific Pioneer. That's how my life has been. Every client I have, I sell them. I mean, I, I know that I could get them to buy something. It would be maybe an easier thing for me and I could make more money if it's easier, but it's not right. You know, and what they really need is this. And there have been clients that embrace it. There have been clients that reject it. And, you know, those clients that reject it end up going somewhere else and end up coming back. One day we'll do a show on just the people that kept coming back. There's, there's been more than just a handful. Right. Uh, you know, it, and, you know, it's, it's really funny because I, I never go well, see, I told you so, and don't bother coming back to me about that. I just, you know, I just charge them more to, to do what I do. If I would have, then if they would have started out, you know, just giving me, uh, going with me in the first place. So Ernie, uh, Pacific Eye and Air is probably one of the most iconic album cover designers in the world. Yeah, we were. We were, we were at that at one time. And of course there weren't that many, you know, in the U.S. there was probably four you know, Pushpin Studios, they, even though they did an album cover here and there, they were more corporate. And, you know, there was us, Kitty Hawk Graphics, Camouflage, Greg Braun with Wilkes Braun at that point, because Tom Wilkes and he, after Tony and I left, he's joined forces with Tom Wilkes, who was a creative director at A&M Records and Barry Feinstein's father, a partner in Camouflage Productions, which was an album cover design twice. But, you know, we and we talked about every cover they did had a blue background on it. They did the Pearl album and a couple other, you know, Jackson Brown albums, and stuff like that. Uh, so anyway, you know, we were considered one of the top. There was hypnosis and in the world. I mean, it really was. I mean, there was us and hypnosis and maybe one or two others. You know, the other ones didn't really matter, you know, and the record companies, art departments never really were in that same category. You know, they were, they were, you know, I could take my hot rod to, you know, uh, to, what do you call it, a Jiffy Lube and have them do stuff, or I can take it to a person that specializes in it. And we were specialists. People came to us because of what we could do and what we could deliver that the other people couldn't, you know. So that, that would explain why some people might leave and then they'll come back because they got what they paid for. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and I've had that happen many, many times. In, in fact, my CBD client, you got Cali Born Dreams. He, I met him in my cousin's head shop. He was selling bongs and stuff at that time. And he was talking about getting into CBD and I had never heard of it. And about four years will go by 
and I get a phone call from him one day. And he goes, you know, I don't know whether you remember me or not, but, you know, I, we talked about you doing a logo for me and I ended up going to 99 Designs, which was this like warehouse where they just take advantage of creative people. And, and you pay, you know, you get 99 different ideas, but it's usually two or three ideas with all these variations. And so they did a logo for him. It was terrible. He ended up using me. We had changed the whole thing, built a brand. Now he's like one of the top CBD companies around. And he, we just, the packaging I just did for him, for his drinks and stuff, uh, just got, he got into K, uh, to Circle K and 7-Eleven, independent 7-Elevens with his products. Just be, uh, based on the way they look and the, and the track record he has. And he's a, he's a baller. He's got a whole line of products. So yeah, well, pack, Packaging's huge. If you see something that yeah. jumps out at you, you know. That, well, yeah. and it was that way in record stores too. I mean, that was one of the other things that, you know, in record stores was an ocean of album covers, you know, and the whole idea was to get something that would jump out and go, hey, look at me, you know, aside from the band that you, oh, I got to have the next Alice Cooper album or the next Rolling Stones album, you know, not everybody was an Alice Cooper or Rolling Stones or a Led Zeppelin. There were a lot of people that were new. There were a lot of people that were, you know, there, but were, had been there for a while and nobody knew. So, you know, having the ability to make your brand stand out over somebody else's in an ocean is pretty, pretty amazing. And that's one of the things that Pacific Ironier did. We really did the stuff that we did. I mean, yeah, there was a lot of big bands that we did stuff for, but there were a lot of small bands too that people bought $5 shoes. Perfect example. You probably never ever heard of them. Right. They got nominated for a Grammy for their album cover that we did. And they were an early, early punk band from the 70s. 72 or 73 five dollar shoes and we were nominated for a grammy for that cover at the same year that we were nominated for uh well actually craig brown was nominated for uh schools out so i got cheated out of that one but it's okay because they came back and gave me 12 more album covers to do <laughs> so in the end you know it it it, it all works out no matter what you know, so, it makes you wonder ernie if any of these people that had hired you at one point to, you know, make a logo or do some lettering for them and they didn't use it, it makes you wonder if they down the road, they kind of looked back and said, I wish I would have, I, I wish I would have used that logo. Yeah, I probably, you know, I mean, I don't know. I mean, um, and there's also the ones like flip skateboards, you know, I mean, I did, I, I did a logo and my problem there was I did it too quick and they were like, well, wait a minute. You know, this can't be that good. You did it too quick. I thought they needed it fast. You know, these two guys, and you got these 13 and 14 year old kids slapping them around and telling them what to do. And I'm like, these guys need to be taken over your knee and spanked. But they were <laughs> skateboard stars. So they had to put up with these little problems. So anyway. John said something that made me wonder that sometimes I guess with those projects, you have to wonder if the artists or, you know, the people in, ever even saw them, you know, if, 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 if yeah. the clients yeah. were, were the managers and everyone else, did they share that? with the group or was it internally made? And then I had, a, I had an incident like that where uh, with uh, Steven Spielberg, where, um, you know, he owns, he and Lucas own all of the artwork that Drew Struzan did for their movies. Okay. So I'm thinking, wow, this is really great. I, if I got all this early Struzan stuff and Lucas is opening up a museum, you know, all this stuff and, you know, it would be great. He's a big fan of Drew's. Why wouldn't you want to own the early stuff? You know, because I got all the early stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I did a book. I did an Apple book uh, where you can order one or two or three books and they put it hardbound. It looked just like a real book. And I did one for him and I did one for Lucas. And supposedly a guy that I was working with knew how to get right to both of them. And they and he I gave him the books and um, nothing ever came of it when I asked him about it. Oh, well, you know, they decided they didn't they weren't interested. Well, where are the books? I don't know. You know, I mean, and I, I can't, you know, so I don't even know whether they even saw him. I think he just took the books and never, I think he was kind of full of it myself, but that happens. That's Hollywood. You know, Hollywood has a way of finding those carousels. You know, you the, these are what we're going to talk about here are some albums or a couple of things that were never used that were done, but never used. And the first one that is really stands out is the, after I had done the Big Bamboo album for, for Cheech and Chong, um, we had formed a relationship with them 
and with Lou Adler, who was who was their manager. He owned Owed Records, and they were on the A and M lot. And and so we had kind of they really loved what we had presented them with, even though that was one of the things that we had to walk away from when we started Pacific Eye and Ear because. I had done those when I worked for the other company. That's why a lot of the early uh, posters and promotions that we did for Pacific Iron Year don't have any, it doesn't have any of those pieces in it because we didn't do it as Pacific Iron Year. We did it under the umbrella of another company. So we just didn't, you know, we wanted to stand on what Pacific Iron Year had created, not what we did. And I, that's why there's no Jesus Christ Superstar. There's no Rolling Stone Stone. There's, you know, no Cheech and Chong, Big Bamboo. There's no well, uh, schools out. We just had to walk away from all that, which was really, you know, for Tony, it wasn't that hard because he was a sales guy. He, he felt for it, you know. I mean, he, 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 we, be, we had become good friends and he was very sensitive to me being a creative person. And those are my children. And now somebody's kidnapped them and I have no say, you know, and that always bothered me. And he was real sensitive to that, but, you know, for him, it was like, okay, we'll sell them the next one. Don't worry about this, one. you know, let it go. But it was hard for me to let it go because those are things that I really liked. I really liked what I had done. And it was, it was a, a great opportunity. So after I had done that, the next album that Cheech and Chong was going to do, they didn't have a name for it, just like Big Bamboo. And they, were, they were, had material for a, a new album. They were looking for material. And so I came to them with an idea called the Cheech and Chong All-American Drug Dealing Game. And it was kind of a loose version of, if, you're, if you remember, you guys are, you, you guys are probably old enough, there was a, a, a marijuana ga game called Dealer McDope. And it was a game, how you get a game board and all the pieces and all that stuff. And it was about dealing drugs and getting busted and getting out of jail. It's like Monopoly, but it was like for potheads and stuff. So. Uh, kind of kind of did this variation of it and i had comped it all up and what you see behind me is like the logo we actually have photographs we shot that logo of the all-american family and then you know the Chin chong all-american drug dealing game uh and uh and so we 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 showed them the comps i comped up that you'll see over here there's some money that would be part of uh see, how do I find it? well over on this side right there at the top. There's, uh, you know, pills and pot and money and all the game pieces and stuff that you would have in the game. And it came in a box. It came in a box like the Jesus Christ Superstar album. And it had a game board. And then the record was in a heavy duty sleeve that would be put in with the other albums, you know, and that would be a customized piece. So on the front cover of this album, and they loved it. They loved it. The front cover was the C down over here in the, uh, right there it's i had this victorian house up in silver Lake. and um so the idea was the cops have surrounded this house okay and you'll see the picture that's right next to it there's all these cops bull horns and guns and cop cars across the lawn and stuff and we didn't really tell a lot of the neighbors that we were going to do this so it was a saturday morning and you know you, you hear this commotion going on and you look out in the street and there's my house being surrounded by all these police with guns and bullhorns and stuff and cop cars up on the lawn. And, you know, it was crazy. And, and I guess we should have told, cause it was up this hill and we were at the top of the hill and, you know, coming up all these cop cars and we had rented all this stuff from Ellis Mercantile and the guns and everything. They didn't have any firing pits in them, but and the uniforms for all the police and stuff, it was really, I mean, it was a big production. We did $25,000 worth of photography. This is 1973. You know, that's unheard of. But we, we, we did all this photography. So the front cover is, the, you know, the, the police surrounding the house with the bullhorns and stuff. And then over here on the back cover, uh, I don't know how well you can see it, but again, I'll send you the images so that we can see them. It's Cheech and Chong going out the back door, carrying all these bags of money and drugs, right? And when you open it up, when you open up the album, the inside is this big game. It's all these people dressed in different costumes from Afghanistan and China and, you know, all these different and, and camels and all this stuff that we had put in. And it was all shot at my house in this big front room. And it was crazy. And so, and then, and, and then we did, 
individual shots for the game pieces, the game, the cards, you know, move three spaces, whatever you get, like the, just in, in, in Monopoly, you have those cards that tell you what to do when you land on a certain thing. And, and we photographed uh, uh, Faye Dunaway, Jack Nicholson, Mickey Dolenz, Hoyt Axton, uh, uh, what's his name from Quantum Leap? Um, can't come, uh, Dean Stockwell. They were all friends of Lou Adler's. And so we had all these people in this photo shoot in costumes and we took individual shots of them for the playing cards and stuff, you know, and, and it was really a great, I mean, it was a great package. We started shooting everything. And then my partner got into a pissing match with Lou Adler who wanted to, there were other stars and people that he wanted to have in this group shot inside. So he sort of wanted to set up his own photo shoot and reshoot what we had already shot on the inside. So he did it, had his own photographer, did it all up. He did it on the AM lot at a big sound stage. It came out terrible. It was awful. It was the wrong angle. It was just nuts. And so that's when my partner and he got into this big pissing match. And they ended up dumping this concept. And they went back to, I don't even know the name of the album, but they're in a car dressed like girls and there's pot and stuff stuck in the doors you know, inside the car. So that's, that's what, and they ended up going back to Craig Braun, you know, to do it because I had done the, the cover with Craig and now he's partners with Tom Wilkes, who already knew Lou Adler because they were both, Tom Wilkes was a creative director at A&M, Bode Records was on the A&M lot. So they already knew each other and it was, a, you know, and we didn't get to do that next album, but I have all this photography, I have the comps, I have all the stuff that we did in that. And, and then what you see down here in the other corner is, there was, an, we did a cartoon, a guy named Joe Patagno, who ended up going, did the illustrated Beatles, and he worked on, uh, he did all the Motorhead covers for Lemmy and them, and, and he's like the Drew Struzan of heavy metal, with all the heavy metal images and stuff, and he used to work at Pacific Ironier, and he did this, we had a, that came with the, the, the game board, and the pieces and the dice was a book, like a comic book, that showed you how to play the game. And that's what you see. You'll see Cheech and Chong there. They're walking on and they jump into the cartoon book and they're walking people through the game and how to play it and what to do and strategies and stuff. It was, a, it was an amazing package. And then what you see up here is Cheech, Marin, and Tommy Chong and I. Um, there, there are two separate shots there, but I cut them and put them together. But, uh, you know, they, they, we ended up talking about that cover. It turned out that they didn't know what happened to it either. They thought that it was going to be great, and they thought that was going to be the album, but Lou Adler never told them. They just went ahead and did this other thing. Yeah, and, that was going to be my question, that you guys did all this work, and it all for nothing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and uh, Tommy Chong's daughter, Ray Chong, Kong, or whatever, she was in that uh, yeah. movie about the uh, cave people and stuff. Anyway, she was in it, his little kids, I mean, his wife. All these celebrities were in the shot, but Lou Adler had other people that he wanted included, and it was already too late. You know, and so it was just one of those things where, you know, it never got done. It would have been a great cover. It really would have um, because there was nothing else like it. And it was the perfect group to do it for, just like Big Bamboo. They were the perfect, they were the only group that that package could have been done for. And I think I told you years later at um, one of Alice Cooper's uh, Christmas pudding shows that he does, uh, I bumped into Cheech Marin and, um, and he was, he came over to talk with Shep and I was standing next to Shep Gordon and he looked at me and he said, uh, don't I know you? And I said, yeah. And he goes, yeah, you're the guy that did the big bamboo cover. Dude, I got to tell you, we sold an extra hundred thousand copies of that album because of the cover that you did. You know, I mean, it, that was like listening to Bob Ezrin and, and Shep Gordon and Alice Cooper saying if there was no Ernie Shuffle and Pacific Iron here, there would be no Alice Cooper. You know, and, and that's really, I mean, that's a great compliment for me. Yes. You know, I mean, You're not kidding. And, it's, and it's kind of true. We helped Alice when we first met him in 1971 with, uh, well, he had already had Under My Wheels, which was a huge hit. And so, you know, the School's Out cover was going to be the next big thing. And, and we helped everything, logo, branding, packaging, eye makeup, sort of big influence by Arthur Brown. If you remember Arthur Brown from Fire, the song, you, you remember him? He did. He was weird. He had all this makeup like Alice and he had a big bowl on his head with fire in it. 
was actually on fire on top of his head and he had this I don't remember that like rope arthur brown check him out he was well before alice cooper but his makeup looked just kind of we kind of stylized it after what he had done but it's something so i mean i was really influenced by that when it came to you know working with alice you know and and, and it was so people ask me a lot you know what was what, what was the best cover what was the best group you ever worked for and it was absolutely alice cooper because there was so much to work with yeah so to pick up where we left off on the last slide the picture that you see over here on the right over here this one yeah that was a that was a box set that i had done for the little river band and i was a huge fan of the little river band i mean they had i mean they've had an enormous amount of albums and hits yeah. And the group has changed a lot, but back in the, um, I guess it was in the mid seventies, I had, I kind of made a friend of a guy named John Bird, who was a creative director at Capitol Records. And we had worked with him on a Grand Funk thing. We had worked with him on a few different packages that we did. And he was another like Ed Thrasher or George Osaki or Roland Young, creative directors at record companies. And, but he seemed to be, he seemed to be a real fan, you know, and he was a kind of a nice guy. And, you know, we, he, had, he was, I was like, we had lunch a couple of times and I was schmoozing him and, and, you know, maybe I'll get some work. He had his own art department, but, you know, he had the ability to hire out people as well. They all did, all, you know, but they wouldn't use another company. They would use freelance illustrators, you know, and so, um, and that was another reason why they owned it all. You know, they, they weren't work for hire. They were freelancers. So the freelancer ended up owning it, even though they kept it. But so I had, I had a really good guy. John Berg would take my call. And he had a little river band coming up, an album. And, I, you know, we had talked about, God, he's, they're a great band. I really love them. I'd really love to do an album for them. Yeah, yeah, you know, maybe I'll use you guys to do it. And right up to the day that I saw it come out, I thought I was going to do it. He ended up doing it himself, you know, just leading me along, you know, jive talking, I guess, because he was a fan and whatever, for whatever reason, maybe he just got enjoyment out of leading me on and then leave, you know, dropping me like a bad habit, you know, so, you know, but that what you see over here is that Little River Band box set. So that was in the 70s. Now cut to five years ago six years ago, and I'm having a show in Memphis, right, at the Smithsonian with all my artwork. And who should come to this show and perform that night for the opening of the show was the Little River Band. Oh, wow. Okay, so you talk about karma, okay? And I'm like, I'm still a fan, but they're different guys now. They're, they're, I, I think that Wayne, the, the lead singer, he was with them before, you know, after I had not gotten that opportunity, but wasn't one of the original members. By the time I met them in Memphis, it was all new guys, but they were playing the songs. And, and so I got a chance to meet Wayne because he was, um, while they were performing in, the, in a different part of that museum was my show, my album cover art show. So after they performed, they came to the show and they were looking at the piece and we started talking. And I said, you know, I've always been a fan of yours. And I, and I, and I told them the story about John Bird, okay, and how I thought I was going to do that album. Well, Wayne was already with the group when that happened. And he goes, yeah, you know what, man, we hated that cover. We absolutely hated that cover. It was not us at all. And it was crammed down our throats. And, you know, John Bird was a real a-hole, you know. And so we kind of both had a, something in common right there. You know, the fact that I was a fan, but we had this incident that they didn't like, and I didn't find out until 25 years later, you know, and so he said, well, you know what, um, I really love your work, you know, I'm a big fan, and we've got a box set coming up, would you be interested in doing the box set? Wow. And, yeah, I mean, you know, 25 years later, you know, uh, and, and I, what I was telling John Mark was that they didn't like the cover that John Bird had done. It was crammed down their throat. <laughs> and when they tried to change it and reject it, oh, there's no time. We've got a release. It's got to be in this release, this month's release. And they had, so they never used him again. But 25 years later, we're comparing, you know, war stories. And he ends up giving me this box set to do for them. Wow. And, and yeah. Did you, did you and, use any of the art that you were going to originally use? No. 
No, because I never got a chance to do any art or anything. It was like, like I said, I thought I was going to do it until I saw it was released. Yeah. It was in Billboard magazine. I'm like, wait a minute. You know, I mean, and I never talked to John after that, but, you know, and I, I never even tried to call him. I thought that was pretty chicken shit, you know, but that's okay. That's just how life is. Sometimes you get chicken shit. Sometimes you get chicken salad. You know, it just depends on, you know, where you are at the time. Um, and so, you know, he, again, you know, said, okay, well, I want you to do this pack package, this box set. So he turns me on to the record company, okay, to the record company. Record company is not buying it, man. They just don't want us to do this box set. Okay, and there's a lot of pieces. I mean, you'll see when I send you the bigger piece, there's all these different pieces and they, they sign one for me and, and they actually, in the little booklet that you see in the uh, lid here, that's a booklet. And they gave me a full page on there, thanking me and my bio. And it was really cool. They were really nice guys and we did a beautiful job. And you'll see, um, I, I'll send you, I sent you uh, in the box that I send you or the file, it'll have the front and back cover. Excellent. I just didn't want to take room. It was beautiful, beautiful illustration, you know, and, and they really loved it. And so I was able to, after all those years, be able to get, you know, my uh, upcoming, my comeuppance, you know, with yeah. him. And, and it was really great. And so what you're seeing on some of these other things are things that were done that were never used. When I, met with Janice Joplin she wanted to do uh like a a 30s kind of taking 30, 30s music and redoing it and she would have been great for that I mean it was like the look of the Pearl album yeah you know something from back in the day and and she was considering doing that and so I did this little logo for her and then she didn't do the idea anymore so it was never used I showed it to her she liked it but then it never really materialized what yeah. point in uh, her career was she? Was she in the beginning or was she? <laughs> no, she was already, she had already done Woodstock. She had, she was already well on her way. It was right around the time that the Pearl album, the Pearl album had come out. And then that's where I guess she wanted to further that look and take some of these older songs and redo them in her style. And that's when I had met her. And um, just briefly, you know, and, and I didn't hang out with her or anything, but then you know, I gave it to her manager who then showed it to her and then they, she went in a different direction. Actually, I think she didn't, she, she, I think she died not long after the Pearl album. She ended up overdosing. The next note over there is Red Jade, which was a game company, a uh, computer game company that, that you see there. Um, and what happened was it was a startup company. They got all this money, right? And a guy that I had worked with at Nestle became the head of marketing at this company and hired me to do a logo for him. And before, and before all that came to fruition, the higher ups had taken all the startup money and spent it and had nothing to, to develop the product with. So it ended up going under. So that was never used either. And then the next thing over you see is a t-shirt designed for Burton Cummings. And I had done this portrait of Burton that, you know, uh, people buy and it's a pretty cool stylized. It looks like him. And so I took that and I put, I made this kind of psychedelic looking thing and put it to put on a t-shirt and um, his uh, merchandising guy um, didn't like it. Okay. Burton liked it. I liked it, you know, uh, but the merchandising guy had his own t-shirt design that he wanted to do. So that one was never used either, but I don't care because I sell prints on it. There's a lot of Burton Cummings fans out there that'll buy that print or the portrait that I do. I did of him because he signed a bunch of them and I have a bunch of them signed. You know, and then that what you see there next to that is the Little River Band. Then down here in the corner that you can't really see that well is a album that we did for Todd Rundgren in Utopia. Um, and he had come to the office. We met with him. He kind of had this idea of what he wanted to see of this fog and the ocean, all this waste floating in the water city in the background i did this lettering so we did this comp so just a quick comp and you ended up and never even got any more response from it. you know so you know i mean things like that come and go the next thing over you see is we had hondo guitars which was a cheap japanese guitar that had a great niche because it was for people like who had kids that wanted to play guitar so they go out and you know spend 150 200 300 on a guitar a kid plays it once or twice 
goes out and takes up baseball or something. So they've got this big event. Honda guitars were very affordable. They were imported, they were made in Japan and, and affordable. And so we did all the logos and branding and this was an idea for a t-shirt, which is like a guitar that's fuel, like a fuel dragster with big slicks and stuff in the back. Ended up using that kind of idea for the California Jam uh, the S concert that we did for uh, in uh, uh, in uh, uh, okay it was the Yes concert or the Us concert in Orange County it was huge it was like a miniature Woodstock and so we uh, Lenny Stogo the guy that was the manager of the grassroots hired us to do that logo for him uh, and I uh, we'll show it in another show but it, it was kind of cool because it was kind of based on that same kind of yeah. you know concept and then. What you see there is a, is a strain of marijuana uh, that was called, uh, uh, it was an American Indian name. I don't have it in front of me, so I can't pronounce it. But it's, anyway, I did this lettering. It was through Phil Hartman's brother, John Hartman, who used to manage Poco and stuff. Mm. And he had this, this uh, strain of pot that he was growing and he wanted a brand logo for it. So he did that, never used it. You know? So. And then the last piece you see over here was used. It was for a company called Stoper and Associates. It was an investment company where they would take your, you know, set up your 401ks and all that stuff. And it was, this was an art a piece that was created by Carl Ramsey. And it was like uh, these buildings in New York and uh, this ship being tugged by this little, being towed by this little tugboat. It had Stopers on the side of it. And it was in an ad that said, a loose tip sink ships. And so it was, at, 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 you know, when everybody was really conscious of what was going on in the stock market and stuff. And they use this in ads and stuff. So that one was used, but I don't show enough of Carl's work. So I thought I'd put that one in there. It's really kind of cool. It, it looks like a New Yorker magazine illustration. Yeah, all the it does. Faces yeah. and stuff. And this little tugboat very tenaciously pulling this big ocean liner in and stuff. Yeah, kind of crazy stuff. And, and so that's some of the stuff that was used but you know but wasn't used but you know we did it and you know um it just really it, it uh it's still good stuff and i have all these pieces and that's what i go back to talking about you know that sketch for janice joplin that's probably a 250 and fifty piece you know and it's an original piece of artwork so i mean it, i did it i mean i'm not as famous as drew or or carl but i've, I've done some things we're working you know? on that yeah, and and you know there are people that you know there are people that collect because they like the group or they like what they see, but then there are real collectors that collect the artist. You know, if you look if you look back over the pieces that are really worth a lot, it's usually connected to the artist that did it. You know, so I think that you know uh, the fact that Drew turned out to be who he was, Bill Garland, Carl Ramsey, Joe Barnett, myself, Ingrid Hickey, they're all pretty well known pieces. So. You know, we don't, we're not Drew Struzans, but that's okay. We can ride on the coattails of Drew Struzan because we were all part of the same company. We we're all working together. It was an amazing time. It really was. We did some incredible pieces.